Andre? <laughs> what the fuck was that? I just want to say that, in my opinion, Resident Evil 7 had one of the strongest openings in this franchise. And what do I mean by that? I mean that it had all the elements to set up a great survival horror game. It gave us tension, it gave us mystery, hence made us curious. And what's more important is that they used a different style of method to set all this up, which we see the unfortunate crew called the Sewer Gators would be the ones to set up the foundational start of this game. And you know what? It worked perfectly, because as we go through the video, I'll explain why the opening portion of RE7 was one of the strongest, and how the Sewer Gators crew helped with that factor, and in the grand scheme of things that surrounded the pre-release of Resident Evil 7, it was amazing how the devs from Capcom were able to pull off such a great start for this title. So without any more delays, let's cover the context prior to the release of RE7, explain the story of the Sewer Gators crew, and how they helped make Resident Evil 7 have one of the strongest openings in this franchise and what becomes of them in the end. Need a nice hero shot of me coming down the ladder. So, uh, you first. No thanks, bro. So even before the release of Resident Evil 7, it's important for us to understand the general direction the franchise was heading. This of course comes off heels of main title games of both RE5 and RE6, with both games hitting record high sales for Capcom, which at this point in time, more than 11 million copies have been sold for each game. And if solely looking at the numbers, you'd think that the Resident Evil franchise was healthy and thriving, which is true to a degree. But actually looking closer, these last two main title games games have drawn criticism due to the lack of horror and catering more to the action heavy aspects, straying away from what made Resident Evil the pinnacle of the survival horror genre that it once was. So Capcom had to make a big decision in which direction this franchise was headed, and listening to his core fan base, that decision was made, hence the return to his survival horror roots. And not only that, they used a new method to deliver the scares for the next main title game, which came in the form of the first person perspective type of gameplay. This was important because in the greater part of the last decade, this style of gaming within the survival horror genre was very popular. Games like Outlast, Amnesia, and even the playable teaser trailer for Silent Hills, PT, used this exact first person gameplay method, and it made sense, especially since Resident Evil 7 would focus more on the horror aspect this time around, and it was important to make this upcoming title as visceral as it can get. And what better way to do that than to have all the scares right in your face? I'm ready. Field. Who are you? What is this? So alright, with that long-winded prelude to Resident Evil 7's release, where does the Sewer Gators crew come into play and how do they help set up the story of RE7? Well, to start, it begins with several teaser trailers that highlight the found footage style theme heavily seen in horror movies. This came to a fever pitch when the masses were able to play a playable teaser in VR called Kitchen. Here we have the chance to see what kind of predicament the Sewer Gators crew got themselves into. And I'll tell you, this has to be one of the most chilling setups for any survival horror game. It was gruesome, it gave us so much suspense, and it left you wanting to know more. And of course, this eventually happens when Resident Evil 7 was finally released, and as mentioned before, the Sewer Gators crew would help set up this great opening hour. With their in-game initial cameo happening just after Ethan Winters arrived within the Baker residence guest house, and shortly after exploring, we find an old VHS tape. Here we relive some of the final hours of the Sewer Gators, which we can begin with our introduction to this unfortunate crew. It constituted three main members, Andre the producer, Pete their main host, and Clancy the cameraman. Okay, I wanna go home. Also, the Sewer Gator's name could be derived from the giant alligator that we fought back in the sewers in Resident Evil 2. But beyond this Easter egg style name, the Sewer Gators were a TV crew dedicated to visiting some of the most haunted areas in the United States, hence why they made their way to Dolby, Louisiana, visiting the now abandoned Baker residence, or so they thought. Tonight on Sewer Gators, another worthless fucking shithole. So immediately, at the beginning, we recognize the first person in camera, who was Pete, the same man who had that gruesome end in that teaser VR trailer. He immediately starts to talk to Andre the producer, mentioning that the cameraman, who we play as, Clancy, was new to the Sewer Gators crew. 
Where did you find this guy? I only work with professionals. This new guy? I'm not feeling it. Don't be surprised if we have to make a change. Because so far, they've made 16 episodes already, and this being Clancy's first episode with the crew, well, all I got to say to him was, Good luck! And man, what a terrible first episode he'll be in. Though the drama continues on with Pete, complaining about Clancy. But besides that point, this video documentary style opening is a great start, because it gives a sense of realism, if you want to put it that way. Stop playing around, we want some answers! Grounding the crew to the upcoming situation they'll be in, using a found footage style from their perspective, it reminds me a lot of the Blair Witch Project and how the characters from that series unknowingly place themselves right in the middle of a nightmare, which the Sewer Gators crew unfortunately did the same here. Ooh. Also, it was great to have in this opening portion of the game that the Sewer Gators crew had little to go by while filming the Baker residence because like them, they lacked any substantial information on what truly went on with the Baker family and why they've been absent within their community, which us the viewers or players can relate to their curiosity, making us want to travel more within the Baker residence just like them. And this style of gameplay further substantiates how relatable they are because anyone in their line of work would do the exact same thing, giving us players or viewers a chance to empathize more with the crew. While slowly moving along with within the residence, Andre does give a small bite-sized info in regards to the Baker family. Joe and his family go missing. Not hillbillies, the Bakers. Jack and Marguerite Baker. And they were quiet, not backward. A lot of bad rumors about their son, Lucas. Bad seat, apparently though soon after would go missing, and I found it hilarious that Pete suddenly changed his tone towards Clancy, especially after he was complaining about him moments earlier. Andre? 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 Clancy, you see where Andre went? Where is he? Unfucking believable This is the last time I work with that guy. I mean, producers, they come and go, but... Uh... A good cameraman like you, Clancy? You stick with me. But I do have to commend him though, because as much of a jerk Pete was, he we still have to give him credit for not just abandoning Andre when he went missing, showing some inklings of actually being a good guy. Well, that is until he volunteers us to move forward, which as he says... You first. Though shortly after exploring deeper into the house, we get this scene. And from what we can conclude, Jack Baker was the one who knocked out both Clancy and P. And unfortunately for Andre, that would have been the last that the Sewer Gators crew would see of him, with Ethan finding his corpse later on when it was his turn to explore the Baker residence. Ah! <laughs> So, so far, this opening portion gave us a good understanding of what we'll be dealing with, which would be a great claustrophobic setting, the mystery that surrounds the Baker family, setting up that tension and suspense that would be most important for any game focusing more on the horror aspect, which I found ideal that again, as mentioned, the tension and suspense was perfectly set up for us when playing as Ethan, because we already knew what happened to the sewer gators when they trekked within the residence, and here we are playing as Ethan doing the exact same thing as them and literally following their footsteps. It's not hard to imagine as Ethan or even us players would feel tension of following the same secret path that Clancy and Pete took while looking for Andre. Again, the perfect setup using tension and suspense. Also, it's important to note that the more realistic tone they approached this game using an unsuspecting crew, making them completely unaware of the terror that's inside the Baker house and showing how helpless they were once inside, straying away from the conventional action-heavy openings or scenes that we've gotten in the last main title games, making you feel that your character was invincible to a certain degree. But here, the sewer gators felt a lot more helpless, not using any weapons, no combat experience, nothing. <laughs> This further grounds their characters as a whole, and stresses the importance that they were just regular guys doing their job, but so happens to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Though besides that point, where does this leave Pete and Clancy? Well, this could have easily been the end for both of them, and if nothing comes out of it from this point, I feel they've done enough to set up for what's to come for Ethan in this game. But luckily for us, there were additional plot points that cover what happened with the remaining Sewer Gators crew, and as seen earlier in the video, we know that Pete would be killed by the exorcist looking lady here, who we now know was Mia Winters. Ah! 
And again, we have to give credit to Pete because this would be the second time he's tried to help his fellow colleagues, which we knew from the first was that he didn't want to abandon Andre, though now in this situation, he tried his best to save Clancy, and even though we thought he was dead, he gave one last try to keep Mia away from him. And in my book, even though Pete was portrayed as a jerk at first, he did die a hero trying to save his fellow sewer gator. So now this leaves us with Clancy, because the last thing we saw from the kitchen teaser trailer was Mia giving one last scare Keep it together. and to Clancy's most unfortunate situation. It only goes downhill from this point because he would have to deal with each main Baker family antagonist, which all happens within the DLC of this game, starting with his encounter with Jack Baker, with the loading screen gives a small summary prior to the start of the gameplay. Clancy tried his best but couldn't outrun Jack. Dragged to the basement staircase and thrown inside, Clancy still gagging in the mold choked air as Jack slams the door on an escape, saying, You just sit tight now. I got some friends I want you to meet. <laughs> Anyways, well the general premise here while playing as Clancy was to survive till the morning. With the subsequent hours, we have to fend off many mold monsters and Jack Baker himself. And while playing as Clancy, just to hear him talk about the situation he's in makes it even sadder. I'm not dying down here. Because we know as a player that he's no boulder punching Chris Redfield. He's not the cool and suave super agent like Leon Kennedy. He's just your regular guy on his first episode with the sewer gators. And look what happened. It's almost morning. Keep it together. Though by the end, he does make his escape from the basement and Jack Baker, but that still wasn't the end of the nightmare for Clancy, because after escaping, the next encounter he would have will be the motherly Marguerite Baker, which a quick summarization could be read with a loading screen here. Clancy wakes up to the musty stink of unwashed linen. Where the hell is this? Why is he in bed? It takes a moment for the truth to hit. It wasn't just a nightmare. That woman caught him and shoved something strong smelling under his nose. Oh god, I love home cooking. But you gotta eat all of it. But as hospitable Marguerite was to Clancy, we still had to navigate around this room that we're trapped in, using all the resources and items to help us figure our way out. Though Clancy had to make sure to put things back in their proper place, because if not, then... Huh? Now hold on just a minute. That picture was there in the corner for a reason. This is what you get. No, no, no. I'll be good. I'll be good. Oh. You better behave yourself now. Though by the end, we do figure out the secret passage under the bed. Clancy would try to make his escape right there. Also on a quick note, I just want to say that I truly enjoyed this style of gameplay. There was minimal action, no guns blazing, just using our heads to figure our way out. Also those suspenseful moments when Marguerite tries to look around the room, and here we have Clancy hoping she doesn't notice that we've moved stuff around. All these small little details just made this overall a great minigame, well not for Clancy at least. Well, the final portion of Clancy in this DLC ends with his encounter with Lucas Baker. The loading screen again gives us another summarization as to what happened just prior to our capture. Hounded by the Bakers, Clancy runs through an open door in the yard and finds himself stumbling through the mannequins and rooms madly dashed in white. What kind of freak would build all of this? Clancy's answer comes a moment later. Think you're lucky? We'll see about that. Struck from behind, he blocks out. Uh, uh, you, my uh, friend. Uh, you, a one lucky son of a bitch. Anyways, well, upon waking up, Clancy finds himself yet again tied up, but this time on a torture machine. Hey, look at me. There you go. Now, I wonder, do you have what it takes? So you two 
are gonna play a little game. And whoever wins gets to walk on out of here alive. So pay attention. Because it's life or death. <laughs> Yours. Woo! You like cards? Of course you do. Well, I played up a game especially for you two. Except we're getting chips around here. <laughs> if you catch my dream. I would say this has to be one of the most sickest moments within this franchise because Clancy is fighting for his life here, but in order to do so, we had to beat Hoffman, another unfortunate victim of Lucas, with both players having to play a sick version of Blackjack and each subsequent iteration progressively becoming more terrifying compared to the last. It seems like no matter what Clancy does, it's just not in his cards to win. <laughs> But as previously before, Clancy would outwit another Baker family member, and you'd think this would've been the final happy ending for Clancy, where he'd be let free and finally escape this terrible Baker family residence. Well, that won't happen. We gon' play another game, you and me. <laughs> oh, he laughed grand. No, I can't take this anymore, please. <laughs> please, God. because the last portion of Clancy's life would be played out in the happy birthday torture room portion of the game, which in the grand scheme of the timeline, this is the last thing Clancy would play, and in typical psycho Lucas Baker fashion, he rigged the game against Clancy, even though he did everything right, and in the end, Clancy does die, officially ending the sewer gators. So in conclusion, even though small was their overall portion in this game, Clancy and the rest of the sewer gators definitely made this game better, especially that opening portion, with the visitor grounded and realistic tone of the video documentary style of gameplay help with that aspect, setting up the upcoming tension and suspense for us players and Ethan, again helping make this game have one of the strongest openings in the Resident Evil franchise. Anyways, what were your thoughts on the Sewer Gators, and where do you rank the opening portion of this game compared to the other Resident Evil titles out there? Please let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Also if you guys enjoyed the video, then please feel free to like and subscribe for more content like this in the future. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, you guys have a great rest of your day, and this is Hey Deva, and I'll see you guys on the next video. What the fuck was that?